Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at a two-part series about this uh, lovely aircraft. This is the Wilga. This version here is actually the 35P version. This is kind of the, uh, I guess you want to call it early, intermediate, kind of slightly higher horsepower version. And it's been a really, really cool plane to fly so far. So like I said, we're going to have to break this into two different videos because it's just a bit too much given that what goes into it. Let's get started. So first things first, I climb in this thing, and uh, one of the things they said about this is this is designed to be a utility plane. And uh, when I turn my head around and look around, um, they were not kidding about utility and airplane in the same sentence here. I mean, like, it's a zipper to basically block some of this. And they've got the headphones, they've got the glasses. I mean, I can see the frame of the aircraft just sort of hanging out all around us. Uh, another thing that I love about it too, and uh, everybody knows I have a soft spot for these types of aircraft, we have all Eastern avionics. So you've got a bunch of switches above your head, everything is lovely and Polish. Look at this guy right here. Good old fashioned Eastern style ADI. Uh, this one's actually pretty neat. Uh, AI rather, this added to the case on ADI. We'll go ahead and deal with that later. Uh, the system's um, very, very different. I mean, look at the stick on this thing it's kind of at a funky angle uh, these doors pop right off if you don't like them so you can actually uh, go ahead and close that up which is what i'm going to do now these little plasticky windows that were completely whoa that was the flaps lever whoopsies uh, we're going to go ahead and set that back the way it wants this is a neat plane uh, there's a lot to it so i'm actually going to go through all the different components of it and keep in mind there are multiple models of this aircraft that they get you when you do purchase the actual package on the marketplace but we're going to concentrate mostly on this one because this is kind of the funky one all right let's do it so first things first step up your head in this you're going to notice we have the electrical system. Now, for those of you who are new to Eastern style aircraft, you'll probably recognize the fact that uh, as I look around, there are no fuses uh, or circuit breakers. Uh, in Russian style or Eastern style aircraft, you're going to have switches to control individual components on board. So one of the things that you'll see in a lot of, uh, especially Russian aircraft, is if there's like 1,500 of these switches, you have one bar and you go click and you push the bar up and turn every switch on at the same time. But you'll notice every single system on board has a completely different system switch on it, including the instruments and including the individual circuits for the individual lights. It's its own system. It very is, like I said, very, very unique. And a lot of times you'll have, for example, the gyro switch to turn the gyro switch on, and you'll have a separate switch down here to actually turn on a different part of that particular instrument. So like I said, it's very, very different as far as these things goes. You can have the emergency cutoff switch. Uh, this one's great. Just like I was promising a minute ago, you go whack and thwack that thing down. It'll shut your two switches off. And you'll also notice on this style aircraft, you know, again, the units are going to be a little bit different. Of course, it's in bullish. You'll notice that we have a separate thing for the over voltage and the generator guard. Yeah, you want to be confused? Check this switch out. I've got alternator. I've got generator. Notice there's two separate switches for this one, and we'll have to deal with that problem a little later on. We have UV switches, which were very, very typical of aircraft of that era, especially earlier, where they basically gave us that little bit of lighting internally here. So floating down into our instrument panel, um, a couple different things we're going to see. Uh, for those of you who are huge Eastern folks, uh, you recognize half of this. Uh, for those of you who are new, there's a couple things that you probably haven't seen before. Over here, we have our airspeed indicator. Uh, the airspeed indicator is modified. You actually have the green, white, and yellow arcs on this thing. This is in kilometers per hour. So um, when you see 100, you're not doing 100 knots, you're doing 100 kph. It's like 60 knots, 59 knots, something like that. Below that, you're going to notice that we have ourselves an altimeter. Now, this altimeter is different than the altimeters you're probably used to. The first thing you're going to observe is the fact that our zero is at the bottom. Uh, the other thing you're going to observe is all over in our little Coltsman window here, it has the number 760. People are like, that's not even millibars, that's not even inches of mercury. No, this is actually a millimeters. This is a different measurement of instrument pressure. You'll notice that if you come down here, that if you have uh, certain millimeters of mercury, in this case, if I wanted to set this to atmospheric real quick, you can see 1013 um, millibars is the equivalent of 760 millimeters of mercury, which is the American equivalent of 2992 inches of mercury. So basically, this is inches converted into millimeters of mercury. You will also notice that this instrument, since it's in meters, a meter is a bigger unit than a foot. So for folks who are used to feet, it's going to be a bit of a surprise the first time you see, oh, I've got three feet to go. Um, that's nine feet. That's 10 feet, chief. You might want to slow down. Next item you're going to see is we have a very, very traditional style uh, device here for the purposes of determining your direction. This is basically the same as it is up in the States. The only big difference that you're going to have here is you're going to have needles that go ahead and allow you you to observe things like ADF, which was very, very common. We also had Shoran, we had NCNS. There are a lot of different tools that you could actually use for that particular purpose. Swinging down here, uh, we have something a little confusing. Uh, this is an artificial horizon, as you're probably used to. The only difference is we have a couple switches here. The first one is we have a caging switch. If you don't cage it, surprise, this thing's going to drift on you immediately. The second item is in the Eastern style attitude indicators, this is the representation of your aircraft. The background doesn't move. 
the airplane moves. You'll see that once we get this thing all warmed up. Of course, we have the attitude indicator adjustment if you need to, if you bring this up and down. We're at a bit of a nose up attitude right now. So if I release that, again, the attitude, we don't have any gyro power, so that's not going to do anything. You've got this lovely little light switch right here. This is going to let you know your RPM is too low to generate electricity because we're in a generator. Uh, we've got the ACHS M1. I don't know if this is the A or B. I forget which one it is, but this is one of my favorite stopwatches of all time. You actually have two separate stopwatches here. You have your flight time, which is up here, which you can go ahead and adjust and reset by pressing this button here. Normally, this little tiny flag right here will turn white, um, kind of this red white, and then turns red if it's running. Unfortunately, we don't have that represented not yet. And then you have this one down here, which allows you to stop this bottom stopwatch. You notice if I just click it once, it starts ticking. Click it again to stop it. Click it again to reset it. S E K, by the way. Over here on our right, you can see we have our temperature gauges. Uh, this is one of our temperature gauges. This is for our carburetor temperature. Scrolling down here, we have a turn bank indicator. Notice this one's a little different. Uh, this one has a little needle here that's going to tell us angle, which is, like I said, a little bit slightly different. We have our uh, indicator. This is our VSI. Notice our VSI is in meters per second. Now, people always ask me, well, what's what's a meter second? What does that feel like? Well, the big thing that I always tell people we got to remember with meters per second is if you're thinking at 500 feet per minute, that's not five meters a second. Those those are not compatible. You're really talking between two and three hundred. So that's going to be these two lines here is your new 500 feet per minute if you're thinking about it in another way. Swing it over to the right. Now, we have an instrument which is going to tell us everything we need to know as far as our oil temperatures and pressures and things like that. Obviously, uh, we have no pressure or temperature right now. Nothing's turned on. But you can see we have a lovely little green arm here. We're going to be needing to deal with that green arc a little later on. Directly below that, of course, uh, you have your pressure. This is going to be your manifold pressure. This is not the same. Again, it is in millimeters here. So when you're doing 800 millimeters of pressure, you're actually above standard atmospheric pressure. Because if you remember a minute ago, this was like 760. 800 is above 760, which actually means we're boosting the engine at that point. Uh, one of the things worth noting here is uh, typically, I um, believe, I forgot to remember which one, I think this is an AI-14 engine. Uh, one of the things you got to watch out for is shock cooling on this one especially and if you have realism turned on it's actually pretty scary but you'll notice it's got a yellow band on the bottom so you're really not supposed to go less than this in the air this is considered too much it's going to hurt the engine on the right is exactly what you expect this is a tachometer uh, notice to make things extra confusing with this tachometer here it's times 100 which you're used to but you'll probably observe a green arc is actually really kind of tiny here um, people like you were at full power and you expect it to get up here it's not going to the best it's going to get is going to be about the top of that green but one of the tricky things is you're really not supposed supposed to be operating this aircraft under and over its maximum green range of RPM. It's just a different style engine. You know, it's a big beefy radial in the front. Swinging over to the right here, we have a couple of different components here. We have this a lovely, this is our ADF system. I love it's got the big antenna mode. You can put it on compass automatic mode. It's got the different modes, the standby and active. You can swap the frequencies on there. You can change the channels. Look at these chunky buttons. I love that. Look at the radio in this thing. Wow, that is old school. One of the things that always surprise people, uh, believe it or not, is we have an autopilot and flight director on here. This is a very typical Eastern style unit. Uh, basically, you have you can turn it on and then you can change your pitch here. You can change your turn here. There's no altitude hold or anything like that. Uh, below that, of course, if you click right here, you're going to get this lovely little clipboard that these folks provide us with. I've shut off engine realism for today to make things a little bit easier for us, but there's actually a lot of fun little buttons you can play right here. And again, you can enjoy all these different options and just kind of stick that back in there if uh, you don't need it. Uh, one thing that is kind of nice is your repeat cover and your chocks. So if I were to actually pop both of those off, I'd have to make sure I go ahead and reset the brakes on here because otherwise I'd have all sorts of fun little issues. <laughs> Let's go ahead and I'll put that away for now. I'll click on the top part of that. Over here is where things get a little bit more interesting. On the far right is the primer. Uh, notice, by the way, it says under primed. It'll tell you if you've primed or over primed the engine. If you over prime it, I hate to tell you, you're gonna have to wait and for it to come down. This is your mixture handle. Uh, believe it or not, this is it. Uh, this is all you get. It's a little kind of a T handle here to go ahead and pull it. Over on the right, we've got a throttle and we've got a propeller control as well. Underneath, as everybody misses this, you actually have a couple switches as well. Uh, this guy right here is your carburetor heat, very important. And of course, you've got your cabin heat too. Uh, this is actually, they call it cabin heat, but it's really windshield de-icing for us in this one. Right below this, uh, you have the oil cooler shutters. Uh, let me go fly up front real fast here so you can see exactly what it is we're dealing with here. Underneath this little crazy guy, we actually have a separate unit that basically is responsible for cooling the oil. We also have the little cowl shutters here, which we'll take a look. Yeah, I was right. It's an AI-14, an AD-14, RA. Romeo Alpha. So this particular one has a little shutter in here that you can actually open it up and close it so that you have the ability to let the oil cool off. Uh, one of the great news is for all of us is if you set this to 50%, unless it's the middle of Dubai at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, you're probably going to be fine. 
Uh, the one over here is going to be our fuel selector. Uh, you're probably familiar with this. Since I have engine realism off, I'm going to leave uh, the fuel selector in the middle position here. Uh, over here is our magneto switch. We'll deal with that in just a moment. But speaking of uh, fuel, by the way, uh, your fuel gauge is located right here under the wing. That's what this little guy right here is. It tells us how many liters of fuel we have. So again, we're not dealing with gallons. Uh, you're going to have to get used to that for the folks who are trying this one out on their own. Directly below that, we have the gust lock. If we pop that out of the way, we actually can now move the stick. Uh, don't engage that in flight. I've done it. Don't do it. And then we have these things called the Cal shutters. Let me open those suckers up. So you'll notice when I crank that, that these little windows are popped open. So if I actually sit here and set this to 50%, you'll notice that the cowl shutters uh, kind of have a little bit of angle on here. And of course, if I want to go all the way to 10%, you can see these things are barely cracked open. You basically get a couple here. Uh, as a general rule, these are going to be open unless you're diving. But again, that's just from my experiences flying around with this thing so far. Above that is your starter switch. I uh, notice it is protected. We also have the lovely, lovely switch over on this side in the event that we want to go ahead and take a look at our pitch trim. We have a copy of it. And look at this haunt radio button. You know, it's one of those kind of deals. Next thing I want to go ahead and show you is we flew over on this side, you're going to see this little thing on the floor here. This is an oxygen bottle connected to our starter system. When I sit here and crank this, I'm actually allowing air to flow into the engine to create an air start. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, starting mechanisms on aircraft, uh, the air start is one of the many methods you can use to actually get an aircraft started. It just seems a little kind of old fashioned sort of a thing like that. But believe it or not, it's a perfectly viable and a very effective bush system because it doesn't need a electricity. Uh, we can basically crank that thing over a couple times, let the air starter take over, and it'll do the rest. When you push this button, that's essentially what you're doing. So uh, now that we've talked about all the systems in here, uh, like I said, if you want to move the door, by the way, I don't know why I would, you got this little handle, you go, pop the door off, that's your kind of a thing. Again, everybody's kind of different. We're going to go ahead and get this thing started now. Now, starting this one is not crazy. Uh, some people are like, oh, it's going to be nuts. It, it's not bad. It's basically the same as any other aircraft. You just kind of remember that there's different buttons for different things. So I'm going to reach above my head real quick. Starting on the uh, left here, I'm going to go ahead and activate my battery. I'm going to leave the alternator alone. Shark spout, uh, shark shower, spark shower. Hee <laughs> hee. I wouldn't want a shark shower. That'd be unpleasant. Spark shower is the switch right here. I'm going to leave that one in the off position. We have our oil pressure gauge. We have our fuel pressure gauge. We have our oil temperature gauge. We have our pitot heat off. We have our cockpit light if we need it. Of course, we have lampe suffit. Uh, that's going to be ceiling lamp. Don't need that. Uh, UV lights. A lot of people like to turn these on if it's night. Navigation lights. I'm going to leave those off. Up here, we have our gyro switches. I'm going to leave those off for now because you just don't need them. Or you can turn the radio on if you need to check ATIS or something like that. But we're going to go through the battery fast if we do that. Anti-collision light is on. I'm going to be a nice guy. And I'll go ahead and flip on the fuel pump as well. Now, I'm noticing over here that uh, we have plenty of power. we got about 25 volts right now. And we're pulling ooh, about 11 amps. So we don't have a lot of time on this battery. And you'll notice we have a big angry red light here. That's not a bad thing. That just means we're not generating any electricity. So don't sweat it. Getting this thing started is a, it's a breeze. All we're going to do is we're going to crack the throttle. We're going to make sure that this is all the way up. We're going to make sure our brakes are engaged in such a way that we're not going to go flying down the runway. We're going to click in the magneto, which is a very, very simple on this particular one. Lift up this little starter real quickly and check to make sure the mixture's set. Check to make sure the propeller's set. Look around and I think we're good to go. Wait you see how easy this thing is to start. I'm going to make my cowl shutters open all the way. I'm going to make sure my oil cooler's opened all the way. I'm just going to check a couple things real fast. This looks good. This looks good. Let's go ahead and prime. I'll give it a couple primes. You see how it says the word prime? It's ready to rock. We just reach our finger over the button and press. All right, we're on. So now I'm going to go ahead and set a 1,000 revolutions per minute, comrades. And that's going to be indicated on this gauge right here. I can go ahead and boop, close that sucker. I'm good to go. Now, some of you are like, oh, you didn't hit the shark's power button. It wouldn't have worked. That's correct. Uh, one of the things I did miss is this little switch here. You're going to want to make sure you turn that on before you try to start it. It's basically the boost switch for those of you who are familiar with the DC-6. Now that that's all set, we can go ahead and take care of our other switches. So we can, if we needed to, we can turn the UV lights. we got our navigation lights. Stall warning should be turned on. Don't need that. We can deal with ADF, we can turn on the radio, we can turn on the turn bank indicator, the artificial horizon, we can turn on the gyro, and of course we can turn on our alternator. We kind of need that. You notice, by the way, that we're still pulling electricity off of the battery. Um, like what I was mentioning a few minutes ago, see this little red switch? We don't have enough RPM to generate electricity yet. So if we actually push the throttle forward, oh, there it was enough. See how I killed, increased the throttle, how all of a sudden we started charging? If you actually float down here, you'll see that my throttle right now had to be about 1100 before the generator would actually catch and start recharging our battery. So you can see at this point, battery as we charge him, good to go. Now, some people are like, what about this? We're going to be leaking oxygen. Uh, don't worry about it. Um, we're actually going to, if we need to recharge this, we actually can recharge
charge the sucker on the ground. We could close this if we had to, if obviously this emergency we need to use it to get us going in the air. We could go ahead and leave it. The reality is none of this air should be leaking out unless something bad happened. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and switch in the middle here. That's gonna be my magnetic compass. And of course, we have our attitude indicator. Now, some people like to go over here and immediately uncage this sucker. Um, one of the things I've learned from um, aircraft in the real world, especially when you start dealing with kind of uh, different models, especially older AIs, is I wouldn't even do that. What I would actually do is leave it caged until the point we actually get the aircraft up in the air where we're actually going to be able to get it all going. So taking a look at my instruments real quick, I can see my engines warming up, but I can see my oil shutters are way too far open because I barely got any heat on them right now. What some people will actually do is they will close everything up completely to basically facilitate the process of heating this up. You can see right now that our engine, uh, we've got plenty of pressure, we've got ourselves uh, plenty of uh, oil starting to come up a little bit. Our cylinder temperature, of course, is starting to come up. Carburetor heat is fine. I'm not worried about it right now, especially on the ground. You don't really want to turn the carb heat on in the ground because it tends to suck stuff into it that's not supposed to be inside of our engine. So now we can go ahead and get the rest of our equipment all set up. I'm going to go float over here. We go flip on our ADF. Look at this thing. It's so old school. And of course, we can come down here. We can turn on the radio system if we need to establish. Radio is really, really easy on here. You can just dial in the keys and actually go ahead and select the exact frequency that you want to. Make sure you hit the C key, by the way. So 11815. So you can see that would be exactly how I can establish that. And if I went to come up here and go ahead and change those frequencies, you notice if you give yourself an extra one, it does it. And you need to go ahead and hit that. So if we go 388. That'll be a frequency 388. Uh, that'll get me if I want to clear it out I can push it again so if I wanted to do frequency one two three six for whatever reason you can actually switch that in directly and then of course you have the ability to dial in anything that you want as far as uh, your ADF you can actually press that button right there to switch channels if you have like a backup channel on here so that's uh, pretty much all that is as far as that goes so the next step of course is uh, to get us over to the runway uh, which we'll go ahead and uh, do right away I'm gonna go ahead and release the parking brake this thing is gonna want to get going on you fast um, so go ahead and keep your hand near that brake well for me it's my hand near the brake uh, for most people it's going to be the brakes over by the floor and we're just going to go ahead and taxi this uh, lovely lovely aircraft around let's zoom out a little bit like i said you got to be easy on the brakes easy on the brakes one of the interesting things about this aircraft is I find it very interesting how, what its purpose is. You know, when you kind of look at this, it's clearly a utility aircraft. And yes, I am on the uh, truck travel lane here, not in the airplane travel lane, I got it. But um, one of the things I was surprised with with this aircraft is like, what would you do with this? And one of the things I've read is that people use it considerably for glider towing, given that the full weight of this thing is not nearly as heavy as you probably expect for itself. So again, I'm just gonna kind of gently kind of make my way up to the runway here, uh, nothing too, too excessive. I'm gonna go ahead and hold at the end and do a run up. All right, you can see the aircraft is almost overheating and I haven't done anything yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and slam open the shutters. I'm going to bring this to about 50%. Seems to be a good number. Slam those open all the way. Like I was mentioning, I turn my head on that thing for a second. You can see we're almost 200 degrees Celsius. It takes nothing to get this particular aircraft warmed up. All right, looks pretty good. Make our way down to the runway. With this aircraft, you got to make sure you hold the stick back when you're taxiing because you don't want it to do a dive. If you jam on the brakes, do you see how it almost wants to lift up off the tail? One of the nice things that the designers included is they put the wheels at kind of like that funky angle, which makes the tires very, very, the um, suspension able to absorb pretty hard hits. I actually really like this aircraft if you're new to tail draggers because of just how incredibly durable this thing is. It really has very, very, very difficulty, a uh, little difficulty, I should say, handling things that are much rougher than most aircraft can handle. All right, I'm going to go sneak my way up here over just south of Warsaw here. Lovely day. Absolutely lovely day. Of course, it's always a lovely day. Speaking of lovely days, if you want it to be lovelier, if you actually click right here, pretty cool, huh? <laughs> it actually uh, simulates how putting your headphones on if uh, you want to get a little less airplane noise. All right, we're coming up on number, uh, let's see here, we have 826, I believe. Yep, 826. We're going to be going to take them off to the right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to very, very carefully bring us to a stop here, and I'm going to uh, orient ourselves into the wind, especially with a tail drag like this. And that should be pretty good right there. It's not a great orientation. Notice I have not activated my attitude indicator just yet. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll pull that out. And uh, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to keep an eye on it when I'm doing my little run up here. So run up on this one is uh, very, very simple. You want to make sure everything is open basically as far wide as you possibly can. Otherwise, you will sit here and slowly overheat your aircraft before you even get the thing into the air. So it's pretty much standard procedure. We're going to go ahead and uh, crank up the throttle up to 2000 RPM, exercise the prop. We're going to exercise the magnetos, and then we're going to exercise the carb. That's really all there is to it. All right. Just don't forget to set your parking brake. That's 2000 right there. We're going to start with the magnetos. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. All right, we're going to try the propeller handle. We're just going to pull it back. 
one of the things I learned to do this. It's, 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 this is not a B-17. You don't have to kill it. You just need to make sure it's working properly. And then the last thing we like to do, of course, would be uh, crank up the carburetor heat and see if we lose all sorts of power that way. Uh, we lost a teeny tiny bit. Nice. Go ahead and shut the carburetor heat. Well, go ahead and pull the thing to th idle and see what happens here. We just want to confirm that the engine does not shut off on us. We should be getting the warning light. We are getting the warning light. Let's go ahead and get power again. I'll make sure everything's ready to go. And now we're ready for takeoff. I'm gonna go ahead and close these up just a tiny bit. And then we're gonna make our way over to the runway. All right, looking pretty good. Again, now you wanna test those brakes, test those instruments. Take a look at the attitude indicator, make sure it's not going south on you or north or pretty much any direction other than the direction you're traveling. That looks pretty good right there. And hold those brakes. Man, this thing just wants to fly. This is especially, this is the big version. The other version is a little bit slower. Alrighty then, let's all line ourselves up with the runway here. We're doing a midfield. And that looks pretty good right there. All right, sweet. So one thing I like to do with this aircraft is I'm going to go ahead and recage the horizon. I really don't want to be engaging that thing until we're ready to go. So we're taking off runway 8 today, so I'm just going to go ahead and line this up. You can set this to anything that you need to do based on kind of what's going on. Everything's good. We'll go ahead and windshield wiper our controls a little bit, make sure everything's moving smoothly. Let me just launch part of my controls across the table. That's why you have to do it. All right, feels pretty good. And now we're going to go ahead and uncage our attitude indicator. We're going to go ahead and smoothly apply power. And we're going to get going. So go ahead and pull the stick back just a little bit and get ready for the aircraft to come off. Hold your stick a little bit to the right and pretend you're pulling the aircraft off to the right. There we go. And now the aircraft is going to lift itself up into the air smoothly. Now you can take off with flaps or you can take off without flaps for this particular aircraft. If you look over there on the right, it even says right on the side, start 2GI. So normally you take off one notch flaps. Uh, right now we're at very, very, very lightweight. So uh, as you can see, this thing just leapt into the air without any concern any way and got us going pretty much immediately, meaning uh, we're pretty good as far as that goes. Otherwise, make sure you have that flap handle in. But remember when you retrieve those flaps, and actually push them back up, you know this is going to do one of these things, which is going to make it kind of exciting for you. So we're going to go ahead and uh, call the video right here, and uh, we'll join you next time with navigation as well as landing. Enjoy.